This morning, we're going to spend a little time and talk about the topic that's been assigned to me, that is the precise moment your destiny is changed. Friends, I don't know if you think about it often or not, but one of the things that I continue to think about as, as I get older is the recognition that life is passing. Life is passing very, very quickly. And the truth of it is, before you and I know it, it's going to be over. As far as this world is concerned, our lives are going to be over. But the thing about it is, we will not cease to exist. We will continue to exist. So what does that mean for you and I? It means that you and I are going to go somewhere. It means that there's a destination that you and I are headed to. And the scriptures tells us of where you and I will go. You know, we're not left to our own imagination or to our own devices to try to determine what's going to happen after death. God in his word, he reveals clearly to us what will happen after we die. And so the question really is, you know, as we think about the precise moment that our destiny is changed, or the beauty of it is that you and I have a choice. We can choose where we will go. We can choose whether our destination will be with God. As Brother Leip has been, was saying earlier, you know, there's only two choices. We can choose to be with God for all eternity, or we can choose not to be with God, and the choice then is to be with the devil. My friends, so really it comes down to where do we stand with God? Where do you and I stand with God? Where do we stand with God? And where we stand with God, my friends, is determined by our response to Jesus. You know, God gave us his son. He sent Jesus into this world, the gospel message, who died for our sins and gave us the opportunity to be with him. So it's, it's how we respond to Jesus that will determine where we will spend eternity. Think about our previous destiny. Where were we headed? You know, where we were headed or where we are headed is determined by where we are. Our position. Our position. If when we were outside of Christ, in Ephesians chapter 2, and I encourage you to look at the scriptures, we're going to be using a lot of scriptures, starting with Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Paul writes this letter, and he writes it to Christians, but these people were not always Christians. They had become Christians, and he reminds them of who they used to be. And he reminds them, it says in verse 11, Therefore remember that you were once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the commonwealth or the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. My friends, he says to us that when we were outside of Christ, when we were without or without or when we were outside of Christ, that was our former position, we were without hope. We were without God in the world. See, because of that, we were on a certain path. We were on a certain path, and that path led directly to destruction. That path, as Jesus describes it in Matthew chapter 7, you know, there's a broad way, there's a narrow way. And being outside of Christ put us on that broad way where most people are. We look all throughout history, and God's people have always been the minority as far as numbers are concerned. So it's not about how many persons are going that way that makes it right, but it's about whether we are in God's way or whether we are following the way God wants us to go. And outside of Christ, friends, we, we had no hope and we were without God in the world. Paul also describes this earlier in this chapter, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, talking about what God did for those who are now in Christ. It says, and you he made alive, in verse 1, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience says that outside of Christ, outside of Christ we were dead in our trespasses and sins. 
Yes, we might have been living physically, and people may have been looking at us and saying, you know, we, we, we're alive and we're, we're full of life, but the truth of it is that outside of Christ, we are dead. We're dead spiritually. We're dead because we're separated from God. And that determined our previous destination. That determined where we were headed. Being separated from God would lead us to eternal separation from God. We were on a path to destruction. That previous path that we were on, as Jesus describes it, look with me in Matthew chapter 7. Alluded to that verse earlier, or that passage earlier. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse number 13. Jesus describes two ways. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse number 13, he says that we should enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the way, or narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. There are just few, Jesus says, who will find that narrow way which leads to life. You see, my friends, if it was just about traveling on the way and it really did not end in a destination, then that wouldn't be so bad. Because persons who are just living life, life for themselves and just having a good time, they would be, continue to have a good time. But here's the problem. All of these ways lead somewhere. And Jesus says that Broadway, which is so easy, which so many choose, Jesus says that leads to destruction. That's where that's headed. But there's, there's a narrow way. There's, there's a narrow gate and there's a narrow way, which leads someplace also. And he says that way leads to life. My friends, that's the way I want to be on. You see, it's because I recognize that life will end. Life will not go on forever. But we will come to the end of life at some point. And then there's a destination. And if we've lived lives uh, that have been lived just simply for ourselves and not being mindful of God and not being committed to what God wants us to do, my friends, that will lead to destruction. But the narrow way, which may be difficult and which requires, to, requires sacrifices on our part, as one describes it, you know, the narrow way means that you can't take a lot of stuff on your back. You've got to shed a lot of things to go on this narrow way or to even get on this way. But Jesus says that way leads to life. And my friends, that's the way I want to be on. I want to be, I want to be on that way which leads to life. Paul describes this idea in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23 when he says, For the wages of sin is death. You know, if we live our lives for ourselves, he says there will be payment for that. But it's not payment that any of us want. He says the wages is death. That's what we receive for serving ourselves. We will receive death. But if we serve God, my friends, we will receive life and life eternal. You know, the Bible also describes this way which leads to eternal separation from God in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 9. The Apostle Paul writes and he reminds these Christians of who they used to be and who they are now in Christ Jesus. And he says this will be the end of those who do not obey God and who do not listen to God says, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. It says, God will take vengeance in flaming fire. There will be punishment. There will be punishment. You know, a lot of people don't like to think of God in that light. A lot of people simply just want to hear that God is love. And yes, God is love. God is a loving God. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is all of those characteristics. But my friend, God is also a God of judgment. God is also a God of, that who will mete out punishment to those who do not obey his word, to those who continue to rebel against him. God will also take vengeance on them who do not know him. 
and they will be punished. So there is punishment. There's punishment for those who do not obey God. There's a destination which ends in punishment for those who are outside of Christ. But the good news is, friends, the good news is that God calls us. God did not just abandon us. He did not just leave us to our own devices and leave, leave us to continue on our path to destruction, but God calls us. Look with me in Romans chapter 5. In the book of Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse number 6, the Apostle Paul describes the gospel, describes the way that God reaches out to us through his Son. This is really amazing. In Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse number 6, he says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. The truth of it is, friends, none of us are worthy of Christ dying for us. But instead, as Paul says, we were ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But the fact is, none of us were good and none of us were righteous. But yet Christ died for us. God demonstrates his love toward us in verse 8. In that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That's God reaching out to us. In spite of where we were headed, in spite of our rebellion, in spite of us turning our backs on him, God is reaching out to us. And he did it by sending his son. You see, we could not reach God. We, could, we were in a situation, as Paul describes it, we were yet without strength. We were helpless. And so if it was depending on us to reach out to God and to avail ourselves of God and what he had for us, we could not do it. But God reached out to us. God became man in the person of Jesus Christ. And not only that, my friends, not only did he live in a, as an example to us, but he died for our sins so that we might be forgiven of our sins, so that we can have life through him. God did this for us. And here's another thing that I really, really love about the gospel message. You see, for, the, for a long time, the first believers in Jesus, who were Jews, who were Israelites and Jewish people, they thought that that message was only for them. Even when Jesus told his apostles in Matthew to go into all the world and preach or to go and teach all nations, they felt like that meant, or they heard all nations, but they thought it meant just Jews of all nations. But the wonderful thing about that is, my friends, that is, that message is for all. For all mankind, for all of us. No matter who, who we are, no matter where we came from, no matter who our parents were. That message, that call, that gospel call, the message of God, is for all mankind. And so truly, as the Bible says, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. Isn't that wonderful? That it doesn't depend on what good I have done. It doesn't depend on what my parents were able to accomplish. It doesn't depend on where I came from. But it depends on my response to God's call. That will determine where I'm headed. That will determine my destination. My friends, we heard so much this morning about being in Christ. Being in Christ. And really when we talk about being in Christ, we got we to understand, as Brother Leip was saying to us, you know, that is the place of all blessings. All spiritual blessings. And he, he showed it, he demonstrated that to us, you know, with that idea of the circle. My friends, and, and let's remember that circle. That in Christ is the place of blessing. That determines our destination. That that will determine when we are in Christ, there's a certain destination for us. The beauty of it is, my friends, as I read the gospel message and as I read about what God has done for us through Christ, here's the beauty of it. Whatever attributes belong to Christ, God imputes to us when we are in Christ. And so all of those blessings that are of Christ now belong to those who are in Christ. But there's a point, my friends, there's a point when you and I, need to hear that message, that gospel message that's been, that's been preached, that, that is being preached. You and I need to hear it, and you and I need to respond to it in the appropriate way. Look with me in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 17. 
The scriptures talk about this. The Apostle Paul writes and he says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. You see, there's a pattern of teaching. There's a form of doctrine that's been delivered. And when you and I obey that form of doctrine, it changes who we are in the sight of God. And no longer are we who we used to be, but we now become different people in the sight of God because we've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. It says you used to be slaves of sin. Whether you want to accept it or not, all of us are slaves. We're slaves to something, someone. And Paul is telling these Christians, he tells these Christians at Rome and also to us, says that when we were outside of Christ and we lived for ourselves, we were slaves of sin. We were servants of sin. But when we obeyed from the heart that form of teaching, we have now become servants or slaves of Christ. You see, we always submit to someone, and we now submit to Christ. You see, that positive response to the gospel leads to a new relationship. In Romans chapter 6 and verse number 18, he says, And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You used to be slaves of sin, but now you are slaves of righteousness. You, are, you have a new relationship. You have a new position because you are now in Christ and you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. You see, it's that baptism, that baptism, that step that puts us into Christ. Not only baptism, but baptism is that step that puts us into Christ. We know we, start, we must believe that gospel. We have to hear that message. We have to believe it. And in believing it, then we have to respond appropriately to it. We have to obey it in order to be in Christ. And it's in baptism into Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 27 where the Apostle Paul, beginning in verse 26, and says, You are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So how does one get into Christ? Where all spiritual blessings are, they are baptized into Christ. You know, there are many folks who will, who will say, and I don't know what they do with this passage uh, here, but there are many folks who will tell you, you will, you will hear say that you don't need to be baptized to be saved or to be a Christian. Well, then you are saying that you don't need to be in Christ to be a Christian. Because the, bap the Bible says that you are baptized into Christ. So if one is not baptized into Christ, then they cannot be in Christ. That's how you get into Christ, through your baptism into Christ, where you appropriate all of the benefits of the death of Christ, as Paul describes it in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1 through verse number 4. But it's in baptism, my friends, that we put on Christ. It's also in baptism that we put to death that old man, as he describes in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Look at what he says. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, beginning in verse 1? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now he's talking to Christians. And he's reminding them. He'd been telling them about the grace of God in chapter 5. And now he gets to chapter 6. And unless somebody says, well, you know, I can just continue to sin because it's through the grace of God that I'm saved. And, you know, it's not because of anything that I do that God is able to save me, but because, because of his grace. So some may come to the wrong conclusion and believe that, well, you can live any kind of life. But Paul says, not so, certainly not. Because you now must recognize that you have died to sin and you cannot any longer live in it. In verse 3, how do, or, how, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? My friends, you know, Jesus died for us. But unless we are baptized into his death, we cannot benefit from his death. He died for us. He died so that we might live, so that we might have eternal life. But unless we are baptized into his death, my friends, we cannot benefit from his death. See, it's in baptism that the old man also, we put to death that old man, or we bury that old man. In verse number four, therefore we are buried with him by baptism through, or we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. My friends, now that we have been baptized into Christ, the Apostle Paul is saying to us, there's a new life to be lived. 
You know, baptism is the end. Yes, it is the end of the old life, but it's also the beginning. It's the beginning of a new life in Christ. So it's incongruous for a Christian to be living the same old life that he used to live. He or she used to live before coming into Christ. Because now we recognize that we are in Christ and there's a new life to be lived. As, you know, the Bible describes this new beginning in a number of ways. It says that we are born again. We become children of God. We become no longer children of the devil, but we are now children of God because we've been baptized into Christ, putting to death that old man. Look with me in Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 24. The Apostle Paul talks about this old man, talks about the works of that old man, the works of the flesh, and now how we are to be new creatures in Christ Jesus. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 24, he says, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. My friend, when we are in Christ, he says, No longer will we live with the characteristic that he just described earlier. The works of the flesh will no longer be evident in our lives because we have put those to death. And I like the way Luke records it when he says, you know, he talks about when Jesus, Jesus says that if we're going to follow him, we must die. Take up our cross daily and follow him. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It's a daily putting to death. We've got to do it daily. Because, my friends, yes, we're baptized into Christ, but you know that old man is always around, lurking around. And he always, always wants to be revived. So it's incumbent on us as Christians that we daily put that old man to death. We do not allow him to be resurrected in our lives, but we instead recognize now that we are to be living for God. We are now to be living as Christ has called us, as he has called us to live putting to death that old man, no longer allowing him to reign, no longer allowing sin to reign in our, in our mortal bodies. But we now live for God. And if we live, in verse 25 of Galatians 5, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. There's a new life to be, to be lived. Now that we are in Christ, the place of blessings. There's the birth of a new man, Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 11. There are new attributes that are conferred on us because we are now children of God, because no longer are we foreigners and aliens to God, but we are now, we are now in close fellowship with him. We are now considered his children. Look at what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse number 9. Peter says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who, were once, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Isn't that beautiful? He says that we once were not the people of God, but now we are the people of God. Now we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, we are God's own special people. My friends, that's only available in Christ. That's only available in Christ. We can only be that in Christ. All of these blessings are conferred on us because of being in Christ. Not because we are good enough, not because we can do good enough, but it's because of where we are, and that's in Christ. And that also determines where we are headed. Being in Christ determines, my friends, where you and I are headed. You know, now that we are in Christ, now that we are in Christ, we have a new destiny. You are now a part of the saved. You know, Jesus is Savior. He is the Savior of the body. He saves no one else but his church, but his body, which is the church. Jesus saves no one else. And so, my friends, if you and I are going to be saved, then we've got to be in that body. We've got to be in that church of which he is the Savior. And now, because we are in that body, because we are the saved, we have a new destination. We are headed someplace else. Yes, we were headed one place before, but now we are headed in another place. My friends, that new destination, 
comes about because of our new position. It comes about at some point in time when you and I decided that we were going to obey the words of Jesus. When you and I decided that we were going to obey the words of righteousness. When you and I decided that we were going to obey that form of teaching. That was the precise moment when you and I did that, my friends. That our destination was changed. No longer were we headed to that place of destruction, but now we're headed to a place of eternal life. A place of all blessings with God, of all wonderful Blessings and inheritance which God has promised to those who love him. That's where we are now headed, my friends, and that happened at a particular point in time. But for the person who has not, who have not obeyed the gospel, you see, that has not yet happened. But in order for, them, for that person to change their destination, they've got to come to that point where they will too obey with the, from the heart that form of teaching to which we have been delivered. Now that we are in Christ... Look at the new position that we now hold. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1, we know that all of these letters which Paul wrote, they were written to Christians. And so this is written to, to Christians here in Ephesians chapter 1. He writes this to the church. And beginning in verse number 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God chose us, why? Because we are in him. In Christ we become God's chosen. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, we become sons of God. Why? Because we are in, in the Son of God. We are in Jesus Christ. We have now become sons of God. According to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. My friends, it's wonderful to be accepted. We all crave to be, crave acceptance. But my, friend, my friends, the most wonderful acceptance that any of us can be a part of is to be accepted by God. And he says to us that we are accepted in Christ. In the beloved is where we are accepted by God. Outside of God, then, we are unacceptable. We can never be accepted. But in Christ, my friends, we are accepted in him. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, my friends. You see, it's always about the grace of God. It's never because we can do enough or that we are good enough, but it's always by the grace of God that we are saved. By which, in verse 8, he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. You see, God did all of this, my friends, for us who are in Christ. In Christ is where all of this is made available to us. All of these blessings, reading on in Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 11, it says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of of his glory. So the point is, friends, unless we put our trust in Christ, we can never receive God's inheritance. We can never inherit what God has promised to those who, who are faithful to him unless we put our trust in Christ. And my friends, you and I only demonstrate or we put our trust in Christ when we obey the gospel. We don't do it, you know, it's not some mystical thing that happens, but it's because you and I determine and we take the steps that are necessary in obeying the gospel, that you and I now fit into this category which Paul describes as those who are all, who are blessed in Christ Jesus, with all of these spiritual blessings, with all of these spiritual attributes which God imputes to those who are in Christ. My friends, because we are in Christ, look in Ephesians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 4, Paul again reminds the church, reminds them of who they used to be and who they are now. He says in verse number 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love by which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, friends, there's never a time that we can boast and be proud. Never a time that we can say, look at us, look at how righteous we are. But it's always about the grace of, grace of God. And it seems like, you know, we'll be reminded of this and we'll be mindful of the grace of God for all eternity. For in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. God is really, really kind and gracious, my friends. Because, you see, my friends, you and I did not deserve. You and I did not deserve to be rescued. You and I did not deserve to be rescued from where we were headed because we disobeyed God. But God in his graciousness, in his mercifulness, reached out to us so that you and I might change our destiny. And you and I might have a destiny now where we are headed for, to be with God for all eternity and we receive all of the blessings and all of the inheritance which God has for those who love him. My friends, now that we are in Christ, our new destiny also dictates, my friends, that we have a new family. No longer, are we, uh, no longer are we of the family of Satan, but we are now of the family of God. I'm reminded of that passage in Scripture as John writes in the book of John, chapter 1, and he writes about Jesus, and he says, He came unto his own, but his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right or the power to become children of God. We now have the right to become children of God because we've received Jesus Christ, his Son. We now belong to a new family. No longer are we now children of the devil, but we are children of God. Which child would you rather be? The truth of it is, my friends, the devil hates us. Yes, he might trick some into thinking that he's their friend. And they can have a good time with him. And they can have a fun-filled life with him and living for him. But my friends, the truth of it is, he hates us because he knows where we are headed if we live that kind of life. And he hates us as, as to why he would try to deceive us. But the good news is God loves us. I'd rather be the child of one who loves me, who gave everything for me, than to be a child of one who hates me and seeks to destroy me. But my friends, you know, when we are in Christ, we are now God's children. We become a part of his family. We also, though, lest we forget, we also, we also now have a new Lord, a new master, because we are in Christ. You know, there are a lot of persons who, they, they would say, yes, I want Jesus to save me. They want Jesus to be their Savior, but they don't want him to be their, be, be their Lord. They don't want him to tell them what to do. They figure, let me do whatever I please, but you can still save me. But my friends, it doesn't work that way. You and I must submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And my friends, when you and I submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we have a new destination. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16 again, passage we looked at earlier. Well, we looked at verse 17, but let's look at verse 16 of Romans chapter 6. It says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? You see, my friends, when Jesus is our Lord and Master, we submit ourselves to obedience in obedience to him because he's our Lord and he's our Master. In one place, Jesus said to some to some people, why do you call me Lord and don't do the things which I say? My friends, if Jesus is our Lord, my friends, then you and I will be doing the things which he says. You see, this idea of Jesus being Lord goes far beyond just, uh, just, just a mental assent or saying, yes, I believe that he is Lord, but it goes to actually the way we live our lives, that we submit to him. In the book of Ephesians, it says that, you know, that husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Christ is the head of the church. Those who have submitted to the lordship of Jesus, to his headship, they are his church, and they are his people. He is Lord, and he is master. Colossians chapter 3, look at what the apostle Paul says concerning our submission to Jesus, that he is to be our Lord and our master. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, I want to read a couple of verses, several verses from this chapter, but I want to start with verse 1. 
It says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your things or your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. And he lists all kinds of things that he says we need to put to death. Why? Because our lives are now, our lives belong to Christ. Our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Now we are God's people. Now we are God's children. And we, we must submit to the Lordship of Christ. And when we do that, my friends, we are ensuring, we are saying, and we are demonstrating that we have a new destiny. No longer are we, a, are we content to live the way we used to live. But we are, not, we are now living to please our Lord and Master. Dropping down into verse number 22 of this same chapter, Colossians chapter 3, he says, Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. My friends, when we decide that we will serve the Lord, and we actually begin to serve the Lord, from that moment our destiny is changed. We now become children of God, and now we are headed to a different place. We have a different destiny. We are destined for a different place now that we have submitted ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus. My friends, we now become citizens of another kingdom. Yes, we live in this world and we may be citizens of an earthly kingdom, an earthly nation, an earthly uh, country, but my friends, we must never forget, above all of these things, we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We are God's children, we are God's people, and we belong to him. And so for that reason, Peter says to us that we have now become strangers and pilgrims on this earth. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. He tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when you speak against, or when they speak against you, as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. My friends, he says to us that we need to recognize that we are strangers and pilgrims on this earth. A song that we sing sometimes, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My friends, and the older I get, the more I recognize that life is passing very quickly. This world is not our home. But the beauty of it is for those who are in Christ, my friends, we have another home. We have, we have a home that we are to be looking forward to that we love and that we want to be with God for all eternity in. And so now Peter says that we are strangers and pilgrims. We don't belong here anymore. We have another home. Look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, speaking of our heavenly citizenship. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 20. The writer, the Apostle Paul says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. It says our citizenship is in heaven. That's where we belong. That's where we belong. That's our destiny, my friends. That's where we are headed if we are children of God. Our citizenship is in heaven. No longer do we belong to this earth, but we belong to God, and we belong to that place. We belong to heaven. We now are indeed the kingdom of heaven. We are the kingdom who will be delivered to heaven by Jesus. You know, there's going to come a time, my friends, as the Apostle Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when those who are in submission to Jesus 
Jesus will deliver them up to the Father in heaven. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul is talking about the resurrection, resurrection of the dead. And he speaks to Christ being raised. And because Christ has been raised, he also says to us that you too will be raised. Yes, we may die on this earth. We will die if time permits. We certainly all will die. But because Christ was raised from the dead, he says to us, we too will be raised. And so in verse number 20 he says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. All shall be made alive in Christ. That's where we are made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits after those who are Christ that is coming. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he puts all enemies under his feet. My friends, if you are in the kingdom of God, you are in the kingdom of Christ, you are in the church of Christ, you are in the church of God, the Bible is saying to us that Jesus will deliver these people, these individuals will be delivered up to God the Father in heaven. The end will come, resurrection of the dead, and Christ will deliver those who are his to the Father. He will indeed, he is indeed the savior of the body. And so it's those who are in Christ, those who from that moment of obedience to the gospel and from that point on decided they were going to live the way Jesus would have them to live. Those are the individuals who will be destined for this place of glory, to be with God for all eternity. It's that point, my friends, when we become citizens of the kingdom of God that you and I secure our eternal destiny, a destiny, a time when we become new creation in Christ Jesus, we become a part of God's family and we become those who will inherit all things as Jesus does. We'll be those who will inherit all things in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, the question is, how important is it to be in Christ? As I've been talking about being in Christ and you've heard so much about being in Christ even this morning and other, time, other times you would have heard about being in Christ the question is, how important is being in Christ to us? My friends, I put it to you that being in Christ is the most important thing there is. It's the most important decision that you and I can make. And you see, you and I must decide. You and I must make a personal decision that we will be in Christ. Nobody can force you to get into Christ. All of the preaching, all of the teaching will not put you into Christ until you decide that you will obey from the heart that form of doctrine to which, which has been delivered to us. My friends, when you decide and you make those steps, you now become, or you now are in Christ. And the question is, how important it is to be in Christ? My friends, you know, life is passing very quickly. I've said that time and time again here today. Life is passing very quickly. And the way I look at it, before you know it, my friends, it will be over. I think back on my own life, and I think back of, you know, when I was a child and it seemed like time took a long time, things took a long time to happen, but suddenly now as I look back, it all seems like a blur. It just went by so quickly. And you wonder, if those of you may have children and even grown children, and you look at them and you wonder, where have all the time, where has the time gone? You can remember when they were infants and now they are grown. Maybe they now have children of their own. And you recognize that time has really flown by. And, you know, when I think about that, I, I, I say to myself, you know, it won't be long before you are gone of this earth. You're only here for a short time, and it won't be long before it's all over. But then what? That's the question. Then what? Then what? The beauty of it is the Bible tells us what it can be. The Bible tells us that if we are in Christ, my friends, our destiny is secure. And there's a moment, my friends, when one gets into Christ. There's a moment when you, you don't stumble into Christ. You're not, you don't, because your, your, your family members or your parents were Christians, you don't automatically come into Christ, but you must obey the gospel to get into Christ. There's a time when you obey the gospel when he washes away your sins and Jesus makes you a part of his church. 
You become a part now of those whom he has saved. You are the saved. You are a member, a part of the saved. And he, he is the one who saves the body. My friends, there's a moment when one gets into Christ. And God is faithful. God is faithful to do all that he's promised. He did it for those in the first century, those who obeyed the gospel. They became children of God. They became people of God. They, they became the called out. They became the church. They became the kingdom of God. And he's still doing it today. Isn't that wonderful? You know, all the years that have passed by have not done anything to the promises of God. Have done nothing to God's ability to do what he says he will do to those who obey the gospel. Just because many, many years have gone by, God is still able. God is still able to save. And God still saved through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is still Savior. They shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Friends, Jesus is still the Savior. And when we obey him, when we repent of our sins, we confess our faith in him as the Son of God, and we are baptized into him for the forgiveness of our sins, he saves us. And from that moment that we get into Christ, my friends, we are in a special place. We are in a place of blessing. We are in a place of of, of wonderful blessing, of untold blessings. I think so many times, for us, for us as Christians, so many times we don't really consider. And we sometimes take for granted how wonderful it is to be a child of God. You know, as I heard one person say, you know, the, the, most, the most wonderful thing that you can be, the most important thing that any of us can be, is to be a child of God. There's nothing greater than that than to be a child of God. I don't care what you may aspire to be in this life. There's nothing greater than being a child of God. And you see, my friends, when you obey the gospel, you become a child of God. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to be, to be a child of God. But my friends, our destiny becomes secured. As Paul said, you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You secure your destiny. When you put on Christ and you come into Christ and you are baptized into Christ, you are now a child of God and God is faithful. God will always keep what he promises to do. He will always do what he promises. We can rest assured that whatever God says he will do, he will do. My friends, your destiny is secured when you decide that you will abide in Christ. If you abide in him, as Jesus says in John chapter 15, your destiny is secured. When you abide in Christ, abide in him. He's the true vine. He's the true vine. And when we abide in him as his branches, we attach to him and we remain attached to him. He will secure our destiny. Your destiny, my friend, is determined whether you are in or whether you are out of Christ. And there's a moment in time when everyone who is in Christ gets into Christ. And that moment, my friend, is when you and I obey the gospel. The precise moment our destiny is changed is when you and I obey the gospel and we determine that we're going to live faithfully for God, for God for the rest of our lives. We are secured in the blessings of God. How wonderful it is to be in Christ. There's nothing more wonderful, nothing more great than to be a child of God, to be in Christ with a secure destiny, a destiny for all eternity, wonderful, wonderful blessing. Praise God for his blessings. May God bless you.